Hello everyone, welcome to the third week of this semester. This week I'm going to continue the uh, second chapter that we started last week. Uh, if you remember, we were talking about the fifth layer of in your computer networks, which is the application layer. Uh, now, this week I'm going to continue this chapter by uh, making some examples of uh, computer applications like web applications or uh, email applications or file transfer protocols. But before that, let me uh, talk a little bit about uh, the Internet Transport Protocol services. So, as you remember from the previous lecture, the transport layer is one layer below the application layer and obviously the transport protocols uh, provide services to the fifth layer which is the application layer so it's very important to know what kind of services the, the transport protocols provide for the applications for the computer applications for the I'm sorry for the web applications and other uh, internet applications okay so uh, we have two very famous protocols in the transport layer. One is the TCP, the other is UDP. Okay, so TCP service is obviously more reliable uh, and it uh, s controls the flow of um, data between sender and receiver in the case that we have uh, a lot of traffic data traffic like when we have data congestion in the network the TCP protocol uh, helps to mitigate the uh, you know the, the mm, traffic and the high traffic of data um, and also it it is connection oriented it means that for any client server communication that you need to uh, create you have to build a new uh, TCP session right you cannot use the uh, old sessions for uh, new client server pairs or for new connections for every connection you have to set up a new uh, TCP service TCP session sorry and then also, uh, TCP has some downsides. For example, it doesn't provide uh, timing uh, minimum. It doesn't provide minimum throughput, and uh, it has a problem of timing. It doesn't guarantee um, how fast the data is going to be transferred over the network. And also, it doesn't provide security. If you want to have security for some applications, you need to uh, have a have an external layer, have an extra layer of uh, security because TCP doesn't give you uh, such service. It doesn't provide you with uh, secure communication. On the other hand, UDP uh, is not reliable. It's, it's an unreliable data transfer. It's not 100% reliable. And also it doesn't provide the uh, flow control, congestion control, even it doesn't provide, uh, the, it doesn't guarantee the throughput mm, and security. So why should we use UDP when TCP provides more services? The answer is UDP is relatively faster than TCP and although it doesn't guarantee the minimum throughput, but it has a higher throughput than TCP. So based on what we said for applications like email and remote terminal access and web and file transfer, we really need to use TCP because they need 100% reliability. However, for streaming multimedia, you can use both TCP and UDP, but UDP um, has a higher mm, throughput, provides a higher throughput. And for internet telephony, again, since timing matters, it's better to use UDP or sometimes if you can afford having TCP, it is 100% reliable and also uh, it 
can give you the throughput that you want but if the uh, internet speed and the transmission rate is not that great it's better to use UDP for internet telephony and for uh, streaming multimedia so as mentioned in the previous slide TCP doesn't provide uh, a secure connection so what happens if you want to have a secure communication between two parties um, obviously you have to use encryption you cannot uh, transfer information the way they are you have to transform them into a different format so that if someone steals it at the middle of the way they cannot uh, gain some information and your information uh, will remain private and secure and no one can uh, steal the data that you're transferring over the web so in order to provide security and in order to add security to the applications that use TCP, we use another protocol which is in the application layer and we call it SSL, uh, Secure Socket Layer. And the, the SSL is something that you need to use uh, along with TCP. So TCP would support in the fourth layer which is the transport layer and on top of it we have SSL to add security to the uh, to the to the to the tra to the TCP uh, protocol and also in chapter 7 we will see more de details about SSL so at the rest of the chapter 2 we talk about three uh, three of the internet applications web FTP and uh, the electronic mail and the, the protocols that uh, should support electronic mail like uh, SMTP POP3 and IMAP okay so first we start with web and HTTP protocol you know when you want to have access to a web page uh, the web page that you want to have access to uh, is made of an HTML file uh, that we call it the base file. This is the base HTML file. It's a file that is uh, written with HTML standards and it refers to some other files. For example, in this uh, web page, you might have one image with jpg extension another image with png extension one uh, video with mp4 uh, and one audio file with mp3 extension so this is an example of a web page that you might uh, find in the web so uh, as i said we have a base file that uh, we need to uh, transfer it from this web server to the client that wants to see that web page also we need to transfer all of these files that the base file refers to uh, from this from the server from the web server all the way to the client size how can we transfer this data using uh, the web and using a protocol called http so each of these objects that um, i'm talking about here in a web page uh, they have a unique URL so they are addressable by a URL what is a URL the URL starts from uh, by a, a host name the host name is similar to um, the IP address but uh, host name is more human friendly however IP which is like 32 bits of numbers is um, more preferable for machines and then after the host name, we have the path name in the URL. For example, in this host name, uh, the URL for a GIF file is in some department slash pic.gif. So the protocol in the application layer that supports web applications is called HTTP, uh, which stands for hypertext transfer protocol 
you know web's uh, application layer protocol is a universal protocol that everyone uses it and it has a client server model the client which is the browser that uh, requests uh, different web pages um, and the server is the web server that con that you know stores the objects uh, in web pages and uh, responds to the request of any browser in the client side so if you have a pc running firefox browser here it can uh, send HTTP requests to the web server and uh, receives the uh, responses of the server in the same HTTP format. And also, you can have iPhone running Safari browsers. Again, uh, that phone would be a client for http protocol it can request some web page and then the server responds uh, using the same http protocol okay so http uses tcp as the fourth layer uh, protocol why because tcp provides 100 percent reliability and it has an acceptable uh, properties for example it can uh, mitigate uh, data congestion and it can uh, do flow control in a efficient way so since http uses tcp the client must initiate must initiate a tcp connection uh, to the server so for http and web application the connection must be on port number 80 so server always listen on port 80 of you know the server's host and this uh, the server accept tcp connection from any client that sends um, request to the server and after server accepts the tcp connection request that the client sends then we would have a tcp connection between client and server with 100 percent data reliability and then on that tcp connection the http messages will be exchanged between the uh, client uh, which is the browser and the server which is the http server and after the messaging i mean the messages are exchanged then the tcp connection between the client and server will be closed so http is stateless what does it mean it means that the server doesn't care when you ask him for some web pages it uh, the response of the server would be the same and server maintains no information about past client requests. We have some protocols that maintain state, but those are much more complex. And you know, the problem with the, uh, keeping the state is if the server or client crashes, then the review of a state may be inconsistent and we have, they have to, uh, do the reconciliation and uh, it becomes uh, a much more complicated uh, protocol but http is a relatively simple uh, fifth layer protocol there are two types of http one is non-persistent http the other is persistent one uh, in non-persistent http uh, we have to have at most one object sent over a tcp connection you cannot send multiple uh, objects over one single TCP connection. If you want to send multiple objects, you have to create multiple TCP connections. Uh, however, for persistent, uh, for persistent HTTP, you can send as many objects as you want in a single TCP connection between client and server. So non-persistent uh, http is uh, slower than persistent http because uh, each time you want to get an object you have to spend some time to 
establish a connection between client and server. So here is a, an example of uh, using non-persistent HTTP by the HTTP client and HTTP server. Uh, first, the HTTP client must initiate a TCP connection uh, to, HTTP, to, to HTTP server um, on port 80 and HTTP server which is constantly listening on port 80 and waiting for new clients accept the connection and notifies the client that the request was accepted then the HTTP client sends an HTTP request message containing a URL you know as I said every object and every web page has a URL which is a unique address to that uh, object and that uh, page uh, this request message is sent over the TCP connection that was just established between the client and server after the request message is transferred to the server then the server uh, creates a response message and uh, sends the contain uh, sends the object that the client was looking for since we have a non-persistent HTTP after uh, sending the uh, response the server closes the TCP connection and after the server closes the TCP connection uh, the client receives the response message containing the HTML file or any other file that and the client requested before and if you have uh, more reference uh, objects in a, a web page then you have to continue running the first five steps so again you have to create a new connection and uh, request for a new object and receive the new object and then the server closes the uh, connection and again for each object you have to uh, go through the uh, first five steps until you are done uh, with that web page and there are no more objects so if you want to calculate the response time of a non-persistent http you have to consider the time that it takes for the client and the server to initialize the TCP connection as you see um, the request message must be transferred from the uh, client toward the server and then the server the server response um, should come back to the client and that takes some time this time is called RTT which is which stands for round trip time you know the round trip time is uh, almost twice uh, the time that it takes for the data to get from one end system to the other end system because we can assume that uh, the connection is symmetric so the data flow in this direction um, is as fast as the data flow in the other direction and also after creating a TCP connection we have to wait another RTT another round trip time uh, for the request to be transferred from the client to the server and the server's response to be transferred back to the client plus some time that uh, a file may take to be uh, transmitted uh, this black uh, line segment is the uh, time that it takes for a file for example for a one megabyte file to be transferred from the server to the client as you remember from the previous chapter uh, every you know every computer network has a throughput and for example if the computer uh, if the uh, network throughput is uh, one megabit per second then for one megabyte it almost take eight seconds um, for the server to send the, the file to the client so the total response time for one object in a non-persistent uh, http is twice the 
RTT plus the file transmission time, which depends on the uh, size of a file. So the problem that non-persistent HTTP has is that it requires two RTTs per object, at least two RTTs, because it's two RTTs plus the uh, file transmission time. However, if you use persistent HTTP, you can have as little as one RTT for all the um, files and objects that you want to uh, transfer from the server to the client uh, for a web page. Why? Because in persistent HTTP, you don't need to close the connection after sending every object file. The server doesn't close the server, doesn't close the uh, connection, the TCP connection, and uh, sends other referenced objects that uh, may exist in a web page. And therefore, you know, the performance of uh, persistent HTTP is higher than the per performance of non persistent HTTP. So, from what we just said about HTTP protocol, we know that there are two types of HTTP messages. A request, which is sent by the client, which is the browser, and a response uh, sent by the server, which is the web server. You know, the request messages, the HTTP request messages are in the ASCII format, which is human readable format. You can see some examples of uh, HTTP request messages, for example, get uh, slash index.html and then http slash 1.1 which shows the version of http backslash r backslash n so backslash n means new line backslash r is the uh, carriage return character which uh, we have in different programming languages you can see the details of a http request message it has different uh, parts. One is uh, one part is the URL of the object that you want to request, and there are some other parts that you can take a look at them. Next, we talk about FTP, which is a file transfer protocol, as examples of uh, computer network applications. So FTP, which stands for File Transfer Protocol, is a protocol that um, makes it possible for um, different end systems to uh, transfer files. And, you know, it has a client-server model. So basically, uh, the client side requests for a file and then the server side responds with the content of the file obviously the client is the one who actually initiates the transfer uh, because server has no idea who needs the file so client has to first request for a file and then the server responds uh, with the content of the file if the file exists in the FTP servers database so as I said before, HTTP server listens on port 80, but FTP server listens on port 21. So that's the different difference between FTP and HTTP. They obviously have to listen on different ports because if one computer wants to run both F both FTP and HTTP, uh, the, the computer has to be able to do it. Therefore, they have to use different port numbers. Okay, so let's take a look at the details of FTP protocol. You know, first, the FTP client must contact FTP server on port uh, 21 using TCP protocol. So, the FTP server always listen to port uh, 21 and then client can ask for a TCP connection on port 21 of the server anytime client wants. So after client sends a request to FTP server for a new con TCP connection, the FTP server accepts and then after uh, 
being accepted and after the TCP connection cre is created between FTP client and FTP server, client must be authorized over the control connection. What is the control connection? Is the connection that we just um, introduced. Is the, is the first connection that client and server um, will create for communication. So why do we call it control connection? Because it is only used for control messages, the data messages, which are the uh, chunks of a file that is going to be transferred from the server to the client is going to be created later, not at the beginning of uh, FTP session. So the TCP control connection would be on the port number 21 of the server and on this on this uh, co uh, connection the client must be authorized by providing it username and password why because uh, some clients might not be might not have access to all the files you know some files need some uh, authentication so clients must provide their uh, username and password uh, to be eligible for uh, having access to some specific files and you know uh, client uh, browses remote uh, remotely over the FTP server uh, over the FTP server's database to see whether the client uh, finds the file that he or she is looking for if the file is available on FTP server, then the client sends a request to FTP uh, server over the TCP control connection, and FTP server decides to um, send the data to the FTP client. At this time, uh, the FTP server creates another connection, another TCP connection, called TCP data connection on another port, which is the port number 21, I'm sorry, which is uh, port number 20, and on this TCP connection, it will send the content of the file that client has requested. So, it is important to note that we have two different TCP connections on an FTP session. One is the control connection on port 21 of the server, and then the other one is the data connection on port number 20 of the server so after transferring one file ftp server closes this data connection it doesn't uh, keep it open um, so what happens if the client wants to um, receive another file if the client wants to receive another file the client has to um, sends another request over the control connection to the FTP server and then after that FTP server if uh, is ready can create another data connection and can uh, send the second file over another data connection another TCP data connection so uh, for the second file obviously the FTP server has to create a new connection because the first data connection was closed immediately after the data uh, was transferred to the client so this is you know this behavior of FTP is similar to non persistent HTTP because for every uh, object you need uh, one separate data connection however the TCP control connection will not be closed unless the, the client decides to log out of the system Another difference uh, that FTP has with uh, HTTP is that FTP server maintains the state. Uh, why? Because you need to know what the current directory of the client is and you need to know some authentication data from the client. Therefore, uh, the server must uh, store some information for each client. Now let's take a look at some FTP commands. Uh, this command, for example, user username, is a command that uh, the client side, the FTP client, will uh, send to uh, 
the server uh, side to provide its username and then we have pass password for uh, sending uh, the client's password to the uh, server and then we have list uh, which is a command that client uh, asks the server to have the list of uh, all the files in the current directory and RETR file name is another command by the client that asks uh, the server to retrieve some uh, to get some file and STOR is another uh, command that asks a uh, server to store some specific file so as you see here FTP is not only a tool for downloading data is an, is also a tool for uploading data so that communication is uh, on both ways and then here you can see some of the server's responses for example 331 means the username is okay but the password is required or for example 425 means it cannot open the data connection or 452 it means that some error happened while writing a file next we talk about electronic mail as another application of the computer networks and we discuss uh, three of the most uh, famous protocols in the fifth layer that support electronic mail one is SMTP the other is POP3 and IMAP so there are three major components in an uh, in electronic mail we have user agents uh, which is the mail reader like Outlook, Thunderbird, your iPhone uh, mail application or you know, any other applications any other application that you use it for composing or editing or reading your mail messages and then we have mail servers um, which are the, uh, the, the, the component that actually store um, emails from uh, different user agents and also we have uh, simple mail uh, transfer protocol SMTP which is a protocol responsible for exchanging messages between uh, the different servers so in a mail server we have a mailbox which contains incoming messages for users and then we have a message uh, queue the message queue contains uh, the outgoing mail messages the messages that are going to be sent soon why they are in the queue because uh, the server's uh, transmission capacity is not fast enough to send all of them at once so it queues them it puts them in uh, some message buffer uh, so that the server can send them in the order that they got received also you know the servers run SMTP protocol uh, which is a protocol between a mail server to another mail server the client of SMTP protocol is the mail server that uh, supports uh, the sender of the email and the server of SMTP protocol is the mail server that supports the recipient of the email for example if someone with Yahoo mail account sends another email to a person with a gmail account the client would be yahoo mail servers and the server would be gmail mail servers so SMTP uses TCP because TCP is a reliable data transfer protocol and also uh, SMTP server listens on port 25 so uh, by now you have to know port 80 is reserved for the applications port 20 and 21 are transferred are, are reserved for um, FTP, con, uh, FTP protocol and port 25 is reserved for SMTP and also 
you have to know that SMTP uh, provides the direct uh, transfer between sending server to the receiving server. And there are two different phases of transfer in the SMTP protocol. The first step is the hashing step, which is uh, the greeting step. Uh, the uh, sending server greets the receiving server. And then the second step, uh, the sending server transfer uh, the messages to the receiving server and then in the third step, in the third uh, phase, the sending server closes the connection. Similar to what we had for HTTP and FTP, SMTP also uses ASCII text for commands and uses status codes uh, for uh, the responses. So here is a simplified scenario of Alice sending an email to Bob. Uh, Alice and Bob are called user agents and you know Alice uh, is connected to uh, Alice's mail server and uh, when Alice sends an email to Bob it first the mail uh, first is transferred to the mail server that supports Alice and then uh, the Alice's mail server uh, sends data to the Bob's mail server and Bob's mail server will transfer data in the sixth step to uh, Bob. So the connection between Alice and Bob uh, for transferring an email is divided into three different parts. The first part, we have to send the message from Alice's computer to the uh, Alice's mail server, then from Alice's mail server to the Bob's mail server, and then from Bob's mail server to Bob himself. So in the first two parts of this connection, uh, SMTP is a protocol that is responsible for exchanging messages. However, when Bob wants to send, uh, wants to see the email that uh, Alice uh, sent him, Bob has to have access to his uh, mail server. How can he can? How can he have access to it using mail access protocols like POP or IMAP? You know, IMAP and POP are two different protocols. IMAP can provide more features. For example, uh, it allows uh, Bob to manipulate some messages in the server side. Here you can see uh, some uh, example of POP3 protocol. Uh, it has some, some phases uh, in the first phase, which is the authorization phase. Uh, Bob has to provide his identity, his username, and his password, uh, and uh, you know, POP3 POP3 server response by saying OK or OK user successfully logged in, and these kind of responses from the server. And then after authorization step, uh, we have the transaction phase. In the transaction phase. Uh, the client can ask for the list of emails and uh, retrieving the emails contents and deleting a content as you see here retrieving another email deleting another email and then finally uh, the client can decide to quit and simply pop tree server uh, signs pop off the system so a more complicated uh, mail access protocol is IMAP. IMAP uh, is not stateless unlike POP3. POP3 is uh, uh, pretty simple uh, and uh, you know useful protocol for uh, accessing uh, to the um, mailbox to the inbox of your uh, mail server. However, IMAP provides more features. For example, uh, it uh, allows you to um, organize your emails and uh, name different folders uh, for your emails.
Next, we briefly introduce uh, DNS domain naming system. So in short, you can say DNS or domain name system is a distributed database that is implemented in a hierarchical fashion. It helps the application layer protocols by uh, translating the host names to their corresponding IP addresses. For example, a host name like google.com uh, will be translated uh, to its um, permanent IP address using domain name system and the distributed databases that uh, DNS has all over the world. Finally, we introduce socket programming with UDP and TCP in Python very briefly in this chapter. Next, I introduce socket programming. Basically, the goal here is to learn how to build uh, client server applications that communicate using sockets. As, as I said before, socket can be think of as a door between the application process and the transport protocol in the fourth layer. As you see in this picture, we have um, two different sides, one client, the other side um, the server, and uh, we have one process in one side, another process in another side, and the socket is uh, a door between the process, the application layer, and the transport layer, which uh, is taking care of uh, creating a, a connection between uh, a client and server. So, uh, as I said before, in the transport layer, we either have a TCP protocol or a UDP protocol. So, we have to talk about two different second programming techniques, one using TCP, another one using UDP. Okay, so in socket programming, there are two different types of sockets. One is a UDP socket which provides uh, with an unreliable data transfer service. However, we have another socket which is 100% reliable called uh, TCP socket. Obviously, UDP socket uh, runs UDP protocol. TCP socket uh, is controlled by U TCP protocol. Let's think of a very, very simple network application example. Let's assume that uh, we have a client server architecture for the application. The client reads a bunch of characters, a line of characters from the keyboard and it transfers it to the server side. The server receives data and converts it to the um, converts the characters to the to the uppercase uh, format and then after converting to uppercase the server sends back the modified data to the client and the client receives the modified data and displays it on the screen of its host system. So when you are doing socket programming using UDP, you have to think of UDP as a protocol with no formal connection between client and server. What do, you, what do we mean by uh, no formal connection, we mean that there is no handshaking step at the beginning uh, and before sending data and also uh, the sender must explicitly attach uh, the IP of the destination to every packet that it sends and when uh, the packets are received by the server, by the receiver, then they might be lost or out of order because UDP doesn't provide 100% reliable service and the application viewpoint of uh, UDP uh, protocol is that uh, it provides an unreliable uh, transfer of group of bytes, which we call them datagrams between client and server. Here you can see the details of a scenario in which we use UDP as the uh, transport layer protocol you know uh, first we have to create a socket on both server and the client so this uh, you know this command is used in python to create 
a server socket and this command is used to create a client socket after both um, client and server creates their sockets the client will create a datagram uh, with the server IP and port number that uh, server listens to it and after creating that datagram it sends the datagram via the client socket okay and after in after this step the server socket re receives the data and uh, server reads the datagram from server socket server socket is the socket that we created in the previous step on the server side and after Sir, after server socket receives uh, the datagram and server reads the datagram, uh, it writes a reply back to the client and the reply is transferred uh, via this server socket uh, to the client side. And in order to have access to the client side, you have to specify uh, the client IP and port number, obviously. And after the, the response is received by the client. The client uh, reads uh, the response from the client socket uh, tool. And then after the, the data is read by the client, the client closes the socket. So here you can see the Python code that is written uh, for the client side of a UDP connection. So here we have uh, an import line and then uh, the server name is given um, as a string and then the server port is given as a number and then uh, client socket is created in this line is equal to socket which is a function with uh, two input parameters then message is created by uh, this function and then after creating the message uh, client si client socket uses the send to uh, function to send the message over um, the server name and server port number which is a tuple so this uh, tuple this uh, order pair specifies uh, the server name and port number and this uh, first parameter of send to fu function specifies what kind of message you want to send to the uh, server so the message is created here and is sent to the server side here and after sending you have to wait for the response so uh, the uh, function uh, receive from uh, which listens on a specific port in this case 2048 um, then this function the client uh, socket that uh, receive from uh, returns uh, the modified message and the server address and also after getting the modified message, you have to print out the, the message, the modified message, because in the application that we explained, uh, we have to print out the message on the monitor uh, of the client side. And then at the end, the client socket must be closed using uh, this function, the close function. So on the server side of the same application, we have to run the following Python code. You know, if we have to first specify the server port, which is 12,000, then we use socket function to create uh, the server socket. You have to give these two uh, constant values as the input parameters of socket function. And then we use server socket.bind uh, to bind the socket number, uh, the socket port number. Um, the socket to the local port number 12,000. So server port here is given in uh, the second line, uh, which is equal to 12,000. And then we print that the server is ready to receive. At this point, the server is ready to listen at uh, 
port number 12,000 for new messages from client. So in this uh, infinite while loop, this is the loop forever because it's while one. One means it's true forever, so it continues forever. While one message and uh, client address is equal to server socket dot receive from uh, 2048. Again, we use the receive from function to uh, get uh, new messages from the other side, in this case from the client side. And uh, after getting the message, we use the upper function to uh, convert the message into the uppercase format and then uh, we you know store the modified message in this uh, variable and then server socket that send to is a function that helps us uh, send out the modified message back to the client side uh, with the client's address given by uh, this uh, function you see this is receive from function returns client side and client address and this client address is used as the second input parameter of uh, the function sent to to send the modified message back to the client next we introduce another type of socket programming this time uh, using tcp so as i said before tcp needs a, a handshaking step which in which uh, a tcp connection is formally established between the client and the server so the client must to must uh, contact server um, by creating a tcp socket and specifying the ip address and uh, port number of a uh, server process and then uh, when client creates the socket uh, it establishes uh, connections to the server side on the other hand the server side uh, creates a new tcp socket for every client that it wants to support so this way it can uh, handle multiple clients at the same time obviously server has to use multi different port numbers to distinguish clients we learn more about it in the third chapter the application viewpoint of tcp is that tcp provides reliable and in, in order transfer of data uh, between client and server so let's take a look at the details of uh, tcp socket programming first a server must create a socket this socket which is called the server socket is the one that actually waits and uh, listens for any client who wants to get connected to the server it is on a specific port then any client can uh, create a connection uh, with the host ID of the server and the port number the server is listening to using uh, this function socket function however at, at the same time that this function is running on the server side uh, the server must use a function called accept to accept uh, the connection between server and client and this accept function returns um, the connect a connection socket which is totally different from the server socket so as you see we have a server socket and we have a connection socket the server socket is a socket for uh, listening to all the clients connection socket is a socket that is uh, dedicated to one single client and this uh, connection socket is uh, one side of a tcp connection uh, that the client uh, requested to create here after the tcp connection is set up between server and client then the client sends request using client socket that is the output of a socket function and after that the server simply reads requests from connection socket and uh, again it writes a reply back to the client on the connection socket which was created here and when server writes reply to connection socket uh, 
on the other side of the uh, pipe uh, the client which reads reply from client socket and they both decide to close their connection this client side closes the client socket and server side closes the connection socket but server doesn't close the server socket because server socket must remain open for other clients to join the server here again you can see uh, the Python code for uh, TCP client side again it's very similar to UDP here we use socket function and we use connect uh, to get connected to the um, server side and here again we use uh, raw input input lower case sentence uh, to get a, a you know a stream of data and this stream of data is sent uh, through the client socket and then the server and the server side on the connection socket will receive uh, this data and uh, after server receives the data and sends the response back uh, client socket that receive function uh, will receive the modified sentence and after you receive the modified center on the client side you can simply print it out and the client socket will be closed after that here is the python code for the tcp server side it is uh, similar to what we saw in the previous uh, slide however the server has to have a specific socket uh, which is uh, created in this line uh, this socket waits for waits for all the clients to get connected and uh, you see that we have to use the bind function to uh, bind the uh, socket to a specific port and server socket starts uh, listening to any TCP request that it may receive from uh, different clients and uh, in a while loop uh, we do the following first we use uh, client socket that accept to accept any um, new tcp connection that a client may send and this uh, function returns a connection socket uh, this connection socket is used to send the reply back to the client so first we use uh, client socket that receive to receive a, a message from the client and store it in the sentence and then using sentence that upper function we uh, capitalize the sentence and store it in the capitalized sentence and then we use the connection socket that send function to send the capitalized sentence uh, back to the uh, client and finally the connection will be closed by connection.socket.connectionsocket.closed